okay, so you got your education, you go to work. Now you're working, working, working. Everything, every commercial, everything around you is buy, 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 buy. And if you refuse to buy, especially when you're older, well, you're not on the same social status as your neighbor who's been buying, buying, buying. I'm paying my taxes. I'm just trying to do the right thing and I'm trying to live my life. When I see everything around me is just getting worse and worse and there's absolutely nothing being done about it, that's what makes you want to leave because you see no hope. Hello, Alex. Stiruski. Ну да, я русский. Так и получается. I'm speaking to a, a Russian in English. And Alex, you, uh, you, we both somewhat like hybrids. Both at the age of roughly 14, relocated out of the collapsing USSR. Um, what made your parents decide? What happened? Can you share your story a little? Yeah. Um, so... I think my story is pretty similar to a lot of other immigrant stories. Uh, my parents, even though my parents had uh, good jobs, uh, some incomes, they made the move for me mm -hmm. uh, for a better life uh, for me. Because I remember when I was younger, uh, I, I asked my parents, why did you decide to move to the United States? And their answer was to give you a better life. You know, during USSR days, people were hustling, people were doing many different things, traveling to different countries, bringing products, selling, all kinds of stuff. So people were getting by. But, um, you know, if I had to guess from the perspective of a parent, that's not the life they would want for their child, assuming things stay the way uh, they, they are or, God forbid, get even worse. Uh, so, yeah, it's basically was uh, more so uh, for me and, and my future. So, and what did you feel emotionally, like, in the first months of relocating? I mean, it's a completely different continent, different culture. I know you shared on other channels, but just, like, you know, if you could, like, uh, one or two things. Yeah, I'm trying to remember what I felt. It, it was a mix of things because I was 12 years old uh, when we made the move. And I remember a lot of things were exciting for me. Um, you know, I enjoyed basketball. I played basketball in, uh, in Russia. Or at that point, it was Crimea, which was part of Ukraine. Uh, I'm just, you know, I'm not saying who's what, but th that's how it was in 1997. Um, and, um, you know, I played basketball, so I remember moving to the United States, and I couldn't believe that I would be watching NBA, live NBA games. That's not something that was available at all. There was no internet. Uh, somebody had a VHS tape from, you know, 10 years ago, and we, you would, we would pass it around all over town, trading it for money, for gum, for anything, just to watch an NBA game. So I remember when I, we were flying there, uh, I saw a TV schedule, it was a newspaper, and I couldn't believe that these are NBA games. So that's something that, as a child, that's what resonated with me, you know? Also, as a child, you're thinking of uh, America as uh, something that's uh, where streets are paved in gold, right? It's it's a land of hamburgers which I never had. It's uh, everything's amazing. It, it's like the movies. So that's really what my expectations were going there. Yeah, I wanted to chime in, in uh, when I first uh, first received my first can of Coca Cola. It was close to uh, 1989, I think. I was still in Moldo Moldova at the time, which is a a, a border country to Ukraine, uh, Pridnistrovia. And um, right. yeah, I washed that can of Coke for three months with soap. I was praying on it like the Lord. So <laughs> yeah, definitely. But uh, on, on my side, it was like I was never played basketball. And uh, I was very shunned off by the white people, quite interestingly. Um, they gave me nicknames and they, they called me bad names. They marked my accent. It was really, I, I cried. Uh, they, I'm relocated at the age of 14, and um, I cried uh, almost every day going to school because it was so terrible. So it was good that you had basketball that allowed you to, you know, fit in. Uh, strangely, the black people accepted me because they were always uh, shunned away by the bi white people, and the black people are the ones that accepted me and became my friends. So that was interesting. I believe you also had black people that accepted you in the team because because of the basketball. Is that true? Well, yeah. Uh, the story that I told that on a different channel was that uh, when I arrived to the United States, I spoke no English whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And uh, they put me in this class, English as a second language. 
uh, where we had kids from all over the world. It was like Mexico, China, etc. And none of us spoke English. And um, what happened with me, I kind of uh, got attention onto myself by showing up on my first day of school in these bright red sneakers that had holes in them. Coming from, you know, where I grew up, we were running around, we were in the rivers, we were out in in the woods. You know, having holes in, in your sneakers was not a big deal. It's not something that I even concerned myself with, you know, growing up where we did. Uh, and I grew up in a, in, in a small town, which was called Yalta. Mm-hmm. So I just remember everybody was pointing at the sneakers and making fun of me, but it did not register at that time that they were actually making fun of me. I just couldn't understand why they're laughing. Are they being friendly, uh, et cetera. And then, of course, uh, when uh, my class had uh, two Russian kids, two Russian kids in there as well, and they kind of explained to me the situation, you know, this is who you hang out with here, kind of Russians stick together. And then, yeah, your sneakers, you need to get new ones. You have holes in them here. It's all different. So, But to make the long story short, uh, somehow, I don't know why, but the school ended up having a basketball game between the ESL class and the school's basketball team. And because it played back in Russia, I was the only one that even knew how to play. And uh, because I made some baskets and everybody assumed that we were going to lose pretty bad and we... We kind of hung in there. We still lost, but uh, crowd started cheering for me at that time. So everything kind of changed overnight. And, and again, this was not the first week. This was after I went to school for about a month until it happened. But I remember showing up the next day um, and everybody was trying to give me a high five, a pound, you know, when before nobody would even talk to me. I'm talking about outside of, you know, the two Russian kids that I knew. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. what happened was the, the kids, the, the basketball team that we played against was predominantly black. And because uh, I guess I could play, from then on, they would always call me over if it was an auditorium uh, meeting or something like that or any kind of full uh, school function. Uh, they would just kind of wave me over. Oh, come sit down with us. Or when we lunch, during the lunch, we would play outside. They would always call me over so that they have enough people to play. I had no idea what they were saying. Um, but basketball kind of, uh, you know, knocked down those boundaries, the language uh, boundaries. And uh, we, I kind of started hanging out with them a little bit. And then, you know, I started having friends all over. But as far as what you're saying and people making fun of your accent, and I, I think that's just normal. Uh, everyone goes through it. You don't have to be a Russian. You can be from anywhere in the world. It's, if you're coming to the United States, it's something that you, you're going to go through. Because uh, people like to point out that you're not from here or you're different or you're not on the same level. Uh, as us, language-wise, uh, status, it could be anything. And, uh, you know, also kids can be cruel. Yeah. So there was that aspect. Yeah, yeah. I, I myself, <laughs> believe it or not, within six months I learned the language because I also couldn't speak uh, more than two, three words, you know, it's very little, uh, you know. And uh, within six months I jumped on that English and I and eventually within a year started getting better marks than originally speaking English people because I had such a drive and I was writing lots of essays because, I, you know, that was the, the thing to, to learn the language. Uh, so what education did you get, Alex? So I um, I went to, when I arrived to the United States, I uh, went to a junior high school, which was grade, um, I want to say sixth or seventh grade. Uh, and then high school starts in the ninth grade. So what's funny is that when I left Russia, I was in fourth grade. And when I got to United States, they put me in the sixth grade and the end of the year. And then I started seventh grade. Uh, and it's just a funny thing I, I, I tell people all the time. So whatever I learned in Russia in fourth grade, basically, I learned nothing new as far as math, uh, chemistry. Or, well, actually, we didn't even have chemistry in the United States uh, up until high school, up until ninth grade where I didn't even have to look at the, any kind of new mathematical equations or rules or anything like that. So that was funny. But yeah, so I went to high school. I went to college. I uh, got my bachelor's degree uh, in business. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's that. Okay. And how did you meet your wife? <laughs> I, uh, I met my wife online. Uh, there was uh, an online dating app called Bumble. 
uh, what's funny is I, I think I don't know how it is now. This was probably seven years ago. Everyone used those online apps because I, I was pretty. Uh, I was older when I got married. We we got married when I was thirty three. I actually, I'm sorry, we met when I was thirty three. And I had I had all these apps under the sun. Tinder, you know, who lives? Oh, people know. People know all of them. And then this app came out, Bumble, and the whole premise of it was that instead of you messaging someone, they have to answer. And if they answer you, then only then you connect. So it's almost like you're getting rid of a lot of people. Long story short, the only person I even messaged was my wife on there. She replied, and kind of the rest was history. So I literally, you know, been on dating apps as everyone else throughout, you know, your last, when they came out, five years or so. And then I just download one app match with one person and end up marrying them and she ends up being my wife and this happened at 33 wow. you know while while all my life you know i never i guess i haven't met the right one yet so you said your parents moved over to give you a better life in the collapsing ussr but the, it, it seems like where they're longing to come back to their homeland and uh, you know what, what so yeah that's the uh big uh difference uh that i found um uh, as far as people that I know, most Russian people that I've met, people, a lot of people that left, they were never coming back. My parents knew from day one that they were going back. They were just basically going there to give me a better life. Um, you know, there were issues with jobs, the economy. Uh, was It was hard to find work. And uh, they their plan was always to work there for 20 years, save money, or maybe even get a pension, things like that and then go back, uh, move back. So from day one that they got to the United States to the point when they left, they were planning, they were saving, they had a budget, they were always executing the plan that they came with. So growing up, oh, they didn't make certain purchases because they knew they were going back. Like for example, in New York, they never bought a car. I was the first one to buy a car in our family because they used the uh, you know, subway. Mm -hmm. everywhere and that's how they would save money so they always they were they always immigrated with the mindset that they were going back which i at the time could not understand my brother at the age of 18 uh, he came to south africa with us and he also he just couldn't uh, stay there and he left within a year invested wow in some, so uh, invested in some herbal life and uh, all his money that he worked at the hard rock cafe as a waiter and he just Obviously, on Herbalife, lost, tried to sell it at shopping centers. Nobody wanted the, these powders. <laughs> so he, this, this, uh, you know, disappointed, he just left the country. When did you, with your wife, decide that uh, you guys are going to, like, you know, move out of USA? So, um, with me and the way I grew up, right, I always considered myself American. Um, it had to do with the stigmas growing up. So when you come to the United States, at four, I came at 12 and then 13, 14. As you start growing up uh, there, you don't – I felt like at least in New York. I'm speaking for New York here. Um, I never wanted to tell anyone that I was Russian, right? Because as an immigrant, there are a lot of stigmas. You don't know you're poor. You can't speak the language. People from certain places stink. Uh, like – all these different things. So as you're growing up, you're trying to integrate yourself into American culture as fast as possible. And with that mindset, as I was growing up in America, my parents always said, Alex, don't don't forget where you came from. Don't forget your culture. You're Russian. And I said, Mom, I'm not. What, what, what are you talking about? I'm not Russian. I grew up here. So I transitioned from being a child to a teenager, well, a teenager to an adult here. My, my mentality is American, and I never even contemplated for a second that I was going to move back to Russia. You know, up until my my uh, until I was in my thirties. So, and what happened was, I, I'm just trying to really think about what led to it, and what it was a combination of things. Um, First of all, as, as you get older, you start paying taxes, you're working, so you're keeping an eye on what's going on in the country, where are my taxes going, uh, what am I paying for, uh, quality of life, you know, uh, insurance, all those different things. And I noticed a big change in the United States. It started to 
slowly go downhill, at least in my mind, at least in the, state, uh, the state of New York, for someone who was like me, a middle class, right? Uh, it was just getting worse and worse in the sense of uh, what I could afford. For example, taxes keep going up, uh, but my quality of life is not improving because I don't see those taxes being spent on where I live. Uh, just things like that. And it was a combination of that and also, I, I, I can't even explain it. I remember one night, um, I was just browsing the internet, and this Russian song came on. It was called uh, Moscow City, I think, uh, by... Oh, man, I forgot. I, I, I forgot. That doesn't matter. But there was a line. I, I was into basketball, right? And there was a line there. Uh, it said something like, at the Moscow City, at the Kirilenko, and Yimati will Kobe Bryant. And me being a basketball fan, it resonated for me. But I also remembered, I heard that song when I was still in Russia or I just left. And it kind of brought back the feelings of my childhood. And I, again, I couldn't explain it. So I started research. I said, wait, hold on a second. What is going on in, you know, the city that I was born in? Up until, up until that point, I never even, I never even cared. I never even so all these emotions came out because of the song. So I started YouTubing and I, I I I saw you know what's going on in the city of Yalta, and all these childhood memories came rushing back to me, right? So I told my wife and I said, "Listen, we have a vacation coming up. Why don't we go to Moscow? Um, I want to I want I want to visit. I've never been, even though I was born in Russia. I've never been to Moscow." You know, I have certain, uh, certain. Uh, I wouldn't say expectations, but I heard of Moscow and some of the things growing up in the United States, but I've never seen it. So I said, why don't we do that? Then why don't we go to uh, Crimea? That's where I was born. And uh, see all that, you know, see where I was from. And she, she, she said, okay, I, that would be interesting. But she was very hesitant. The first thing she said is, Am I going to be accepted there? Because my life, my, my wife is Latin. Um, she's half Guatemalan, half Colombian. So her, her skin color is a little bit darker. And I mean, I, I, I made another video about it. And uh, when I finally showed my wife on my channel, people were like, what? Everybody thought she was a lot darker than she was, right? But her question was, even, even though she was just barely darker than me, am I going to be okay there? Am I going to be accepted there? Because... Everything that she knew about Russia was that it was all just, uh, you know, Caucasian white people, blonde hair and uh, skinheads. So and then it's funny because after we went back there, she she, you know, she realized there was like over 20 different nationalities that people way darker than her. She also fits in. People were claiming her, you know, she's a Crimean Tatar or she's uh, from Uzbekistan or she could. So it, it was a culture shock for her. But um, anyway, to. Get back to my story. So she, she um, he agreed to go. We went, and to be honest with you, we were just completely amazed. Uh, from what I my expectations were, knowing what I knew and what actually happened. Um, and I touched on uh that this a little bit before, but I remember first of all the city was absolutely beautiful. The architecture was beautiful. Um, everything was clean. People were dressed, uh, very well. You know, uh, in New York, uh, and again, I, I know people get mad at me. People write me in the comments, oh, you, you're generalizing. But I'm just speaking, I'm giving you my point of view. Like, this is what I saw. I'm not saying everyone is like this. But in New York, you know, you come out, depending where you live, you got your flip-flops on, you got your shorts. And, and I'm sure, you know, there are parts, many parts of Russia are the same way. But even in New York, which you can compare to Moscow, right? Some people tell me Moscow is not Russia. But, okay, New York is also New York. It's a, It's a... But people walking around, the, the the style is different. Moscow was like very professional. And the other thing is, I, I, I'm telling my wife, and I'm like, I know this is not normal, but nobody's screaming around here. And the fact that I'm realizing that, that kind of says something about myself and where, where we live. That's the first thing you notice, that nobody's screaming, nobody's fighting, nobody's... Uh, in, in New York, it's such a, it's such a big place. But also part of your culture, there's a lot going on. You know, you could be, uh, there's a lot of friendly people, but you could also get into a lot of altercations just because you look at somebody a certain way and they say, do you know me? Uh, all those things. So I didn't see it. It was like a very, uh, it, 
it it was a very I, I can't pick the right word that I would use, but it just seemed more civilized to me, right? Interesting. So that interesting, was impression. Interesting. Sorry, it, uh, we'll we'll get, get yeah, back there. Uh, I've I've been to America three times myself, and I've been to New York, and what I noticed is like people are hustling. Like everybody, like not everybody, but I went into underground, and there's this hobo, like um, you know, homeless m- uh, man. Uh, is uh, talking to me and asking me for money and it's like you know people get into your space and that's what i noticed yeah. when uh, i went to america and another thing i noticed a lot of people are like i don't know you know like a- every 20th or every 30th person like maybe two percent two three percent of people i saw are somewhat mentally something not right like uh, i don't know i'm not you know, I hope I'm not offending anybody, but you know, like some form of so, mental. Th- could you? What, what are your What are your thoughts on that? So you just touched up something that I speak on a lot because this is what I noticed, and I don't hear anyone else talk about this. And I'm talking about New York, but mental illness is ridiculously high there. I used to work in Jamaica, Queens. For those that know, uh, they might know that area, but uh, it's um. It, it, it's more of a poor neighborhood uh, with people making less money. And the amount of other than homeless people, half of the homeless people were, they had mental issues, right? But even like, like I'll give you an example. I'm going to work for a month straight. There was a guy, he would walk around. Uh, he was homeless with a deck of cards. He would constantly shuffle these cards, just walking around, talking to himself, shuffling these cards, shuffling these cards, shuffling these cards. I would come out and go to my lunch break to get a cup of coffee. I would get approached right away uh, because I'm white. And that neighborhood was, it, it, it's a mix of uh, black, uh, Hispanic, Middle Eastern, and some white. People would constantly approach you for money. They would ask you, if you go going to get a coffee, you would always be asked, give me a give me dollar, yo, give me a dollar, give me a dollar. Um, but to get back to the topic, the mental illness is very, very high in New York. And I think that contributes to people being in your space. But because so many people are in your space, other people are used to it now. And they, it's always a confrontation. They expect somebody to be in your space, even when you're just trying to approach them. So it creates this hostile communication before a word is even spoken. If I, I don't know you, you have no reason for you to approach me, right? While in other countries, I might be say hello to you just because we're walking down the street. So if me and you are walking down the street and we lock eyes, I might smile and say, hey, how are you? You know, because we just kind of met, uh, locked eyes and not to make it awkward, say, how are you? In New York, you could have somebody do that to you or you could say, do I know you? You know, why are you talking to me? What's your problem? You know, and, and just because you would lock eyes with that person, it depends who it is. And. There's absolutely nothing being done with mental illness. People commit all kinds of crimes because they're not there. They need help. But all, all it is is they book them. They bring them to the precinct, process them. Four hours later, they let them out. They're not getting any type of help. I've seen these people. Like there was, you know, after working for a while where I was working, you kind of remember everyone. All, you see the same people acting crazy every day. One time I saw this guy that we saw all the time. I don't know if he was off his medication. He started uh, fighting people. Cops came, arrested him. And this whole thing, you know, two days later, he was laying there again, back. And that's the thing that really shocked me about New York is there's a lot of crime, especially recently. And that, that was another reason why we decided to move. I just saw the city degrading. And that crime is not something that you can foresee. Like back in USSR, you know, you uh, in the 90s, there was all this like organized crime. There was all the or even like somebody if you're walking down the street and somebody looks like they're up to no good. Right. You either avoid that person or you can see there might be an issue. There's a lot of crime where somebody would come up in New York to a random person and punch him in the face out of nowhere. There would be no communication. There would be nothing that connects these two people. People getting pushed in front of the train all the time because of the mental illness that runs rampant in the city and nothing is being done about it. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting that you touched on to crime because that's actually the reason I left South Africa because, you know, yeah. I had I been held at a gunpoint. Literally, the three men walked in with guns and robbed us for about three hours that tied us up. Then we moved out of the city on, well, first of all, we 
bought this mortgage house so we could put security. So so got this home with the put a barbed wire, electric fencing, and burglar Jesus. bars on all the windows, thick rods so it looked like jail, and nobody could get in. But obviously, I, 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 the, the neighbors next door they opened their gate and they got into through the gate. So constantly being in fear that we moved onto the land, and there my ex-wife got tied up with another two guys that came with a knife and a hammer and it's constantly my mom's been robbed it's everybody i know has had either hijacking at a gunpoint or robbery and eventually after nine robberies later i would decided like it's not gonna stop nine and nine yeah and then God. various from little ones the computer being stolen uh, another computer being yeah stolen. Like literally <laughs> walked out for five minutes out of my room into the garden. I came back. My, my, my whole big Mac was gone and a laptop. <laughs> you know, Jesus. it was <laughs> so it's like somebody watching you all the time. I left alone basically to Russia um, after reading strangely books on Anastasia about this one hectare space of love. I got very hooked onto the books that, you know, creating your own like nest on one hectare, like your garden of Eden. So that was back in 2011 when I read it. And uh, uh, yeah, so I was very excited to come back to the homeland. And we'll touch on the being back in Russia as well, because it presented some other challenges that, uh, you know, I, I didn't know because I thought it was going to be a saving grace. Yeah. How did you? I have so much. Yeah. yeah. So Kara. just to, before we move on, I have so much to add to this conversation, but um, not to make this too long, I will. Just add one thing. First of all, you guys are on another level. Um, I don't know that much about South Africa. What what I do know, and we have some friends from there. It, it's it's another level of crime. You know, you can't even compare it to New York City, right? But the point that I'm trying to make is this: you can live in a place that is not safe. Um, there are a lot of issues with it, but at least you can see the government do something about it. And then you can make a decision and say, okay, it's going to take time, but this is where I'm from, and things will get better. Mm -hmm. In New York, every single law that was passed was making things worse. First, uh, we had uh, bail reform. So bail reform, what happened before bail reform was if somebody commits a crime, they take it to the, to the precinct, and then they have to be, see a judge, and the judge would give them bail basically amount of money they have to pay based on the crime that they committed. And if they, if it's a serious crime, the money would be high and they would stay in jail. So with the crime going up, they got rid of that. We had a person rob a bank twice in one day. He would ro he robbed the bank, booked him, four hours later, let him out. He went back, robbed it again. Uh, so <laughs> as some, as right. So as someone that's, uh, I'm paying my taxes. I'm just trying to do the right thing and I'm trying to live my life. When I see everything around me is just getting worse and worse and there's absolutely nothing being done about it, that's what makes you want to leave because you see no hope. And I think South Africa was, you're in a similar position. You know, you went from getting a house with all kinds of rods and security, which is not a life. What You live in Iraq. Nobody wants to live like that, right? But so you went, but you already doing that, and then things happen to you anyway. So you get to a point where you just don't see any hope other than, you know, to move. Yeah, and, uh, talking about just the last touch on security. After I installed the barbed wire and electric fencing, I saw a guy climb through my electric fencing, which was switched on at ten thousand volts. He was being shocked, and he robbed the house next door, and he was climbing through into my property, and. <laughs> but anyway, I think we spoke a lot about crime. Another thing to, to that that really put uh, put us off, which I never noticed, but my wife when she came visit uh, South Africa, she kept on telling me like, "Let's go for a walk." You know, like in in, in Russia, we can, you know, let's go pagulayim. Yeah, let's go for you go out mm -hmm. into the streets and then you go into a park or it's like you chill on the roofs. You, you like whatever the, the forest. Usually, there is a forest somewhere nearby. Or um, a public, like a beach, park. Or mountains, exactly. Lots of parks, and it's all safe. You don't need to worry about anything. Yeah, I couldn't take her. The parks are dangerous. We had a friend being robbed uh, and stolen. That took her bag in the middle of the day with uh, with a knife in the middle of a, a public park. So parks are no go zone. And so I said, so 
we just walked between the streets. So you can imagine the suburbia, home, 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 home. And you walk along up and down the street, that kind of thing. And she's like, Zoya's like, no, but I want to see in like nature, like trees and then, you know, like not homes, not suburbia. No, you don't. Uh, so I, to- I took her out into near Johannesburg was a little bit of like a mountain, like a little ridge stuff. As soon as we chilled, we sat down. The- there was no fences. Like it's a usual spot that I would go uh, and actually I smoked weed there. But uh, <laughs> it was way back. Anyway, these men came um, and they told us private property, get the hell off here. Uh, so there was nowhere to go. Everybody's everywhere's private property. Trespassers will be shot and prosecuted. Parks are dangerous. So you end up walking between suburbia. So that was, that really put her off. She's like, well, there's nowhere to go for a walk. No, I don't want to be sitting inside right. doors all day. Yes. Yeah, so like, why would you live there? That's the question. So let me ask you a question. Uh, actually, I have a question for you. When your parents chose to uh, to move to South Africa, uh, what was their reasoning? And when you moved there, were things that way already? Or you know they degraded over time? Well, my dad, as I subsequently, uh, through my own investigation and, and some conceptualizing with my wife, we came to understand that my dad was one of the people that was robbing Russia. Whilst in the 90s, people had no food, nothing. They were poor. The nuclear reactor physics, physics that people that were brains behind developing nuclear reactors were sweeping streets after, you know, the USA worked with Gorbachev and Yeltsin. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeltsin mm-hmm. came out there, God bless America, everybody, all the Russians like, oh, my God, what are you doing? Right. You know, a- a- anyway, you know, uh, uh, most cleverest people just swept streets, selling at the markets, <laughs> chewing gum yeah. and, and, and that kind of thing. So my dad was just like really swimming in chocolate, like just, you know, Chinese restaurants, uh, full on. Uh, so he was selling bakeries. I believe there were these these equipment, the stainless steel equipment for sausage, uh, fact, mini, mini sausage factories and stuff, bakeries and stuff. And uh, he was just selling that, but he was getting them very cheap somewhere. So obviously, big uh, processing factories were closing down, and uh, the equipment. Somebody was buying made, up all those things. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very cheap, or you know, maybe not even buying, just taking. I don't know. You know, I, I don't. I was too young at the time, thirteen, to to understand. But all I know that before we knew, it was he had seven flats. Yeah, uh, quite a few in Moscow, and uh, uh, and we were always holidays out. So suddenly, within two weeks, they're like, "Okay." I mean, they didn't even tell me. First, I saw my Lego go. Then I saw my, my skateboard go, my rollerblades go. Nobody told me anything. Like, come, let's go. You know. And the next thing, I end up in Johannesburg in another world, um, in you know, in a shopping center, which was a big, big. You know, obviously change. Although Moscow was uh, different already then in the 1994, it was still a shock because I was a new, new country. Nobody even asked. Nobody even told me. They, nobody brought my toys. I, I somewhat feel a little, you know, because I see my mom brought over over 200 kilograms of books with her. And my little, like, wow. I had really nice Lego with hydraulics, you know, like nice mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, technique, techniques type of Lego. And uh, nobody even brought that. So I was like still a little, you know, um, yeah, just a little something left uh, uh, and not nice in my feeling inside. And um, right. so, so they, never, it, they never thought of you, basically. Yeah. You were the afterthought of what would make you feel comfortable or exactly, exactly. make the transition easier. Yeah, yeah. All, all for my whole childhood, I remember like uh, mom was busy, dad is busy, and I always was alone working with little um, Americano. Americano is a similar thing right now. Anyway, so I was always playing with uh, constructing things. It was like my thing. So to take that away was, uh, uh, you know, like a serious hit. And in terms of your second question, um, Alex, you know the, the apartheid where England came in and it was colonized. Uh, you know. Uh, um, South Africa, uh, so they treated black people really, really, really bad. And then the whole, you know, apartheid was over. So suddenly, in the DNA of all these black people, was that white people are 
horrible, you know, uh, you know, just a memory how we mistreated them. So I had nothing to do with it, you know. I came, right, right, I right. came after, but I got the the blunt of it, just of that aggression. You know, we believe that nothing in the universe goes un un forgotten. You know, you poke here. It poke, pokes out there. That it's just the way it works. It's a boomerang effect. Cause an effect. Cause an effect. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so the crime was. Uh, it, it did get progressively worse. It did get from no electric fence. Suddenly, everybody had electric fence. Uh, so, That's so, crazy. And then moving to areas that were more, more safer than security guards, uh, locking off entire areas to you know like uh, like a building of a state which under huge walls. So there's thousands of homes in this uh, villages to talking about one of them my friend tony he couldn't plant tomatoes <laughs> he had to hide tomatoes between the flowers in one of these estates because they obviously come with you know uh, what, what is it called um, rules uh, homeowners uh, you know what, what is it oh uh, yeah hoa a homeowners association where exactly you have to... so so, yeah. so it's lawn and flowers and over you know and the guy was really eco-friendly. He's like, <laughs> he had to like, oh, look, tomatoes behind my flowers, you know. And, uh, you know, it just, we could, and then I hear a story of somebody in America b being jailed for harvesting water. I'm not saying all the states, but there was a precedent like that. Did you hear of anything like that? Um, harvesting water? No. Just to touch up on what you said, I did, I do see a lot of it when I start reading uh, certain things. And, you know, people call them conspiracies or whatever. But at the end of the day, me and you already, you know, we're a little bit older. We're probably reaching our late 30s, 40s, right? So as you live your life and you look back on your life, you can start putting pieces together. You have a, this long thread of things. And when I start reading about what's happening, you can kind of look back and say, wait, the same thing happened here. Same thing happened here. Same thing happened here. So you start to see a trend. Um, and as far as water and people not able to plant things, you start seeing this right now. And, and I think in U.S. they're passing all kinds of laws as far as farming goes. You can't farm this. You can't like, for example, milk. I remember, you know, growing up in, you know, when I lived in Russia, neighbor had a cow. You go in, you milk the cow and you, you drink fresh milk or you might boil it and then drink it. All that is forbidden. That is against the law in, in, in America. You cannot drink fresh milk anymore, or you cannot. Um, then farming, then all these laws being passed, it seems like that are really squeezing either the farming community or even yourself if you're trying to, uh, you know, better yourself. Let's say I want to uh, grow my own veggies, grow my own things. But right now it's on a big scale, so. There's definitely something to it, but uh, touch up on what you say in the plan against humanity and all that. You know, we can talk about it all day, but I'll tell you one thing. What I noticed in the United States, right, that's been happening in the last seven years uh, in schools and the mindset and all of that, people try to um, analyze it. Mm -hmm. And they try to approach it from a common sense standpoint. Why would they do this? If the crime is going up, why would you get rid of bail reform to allow more crime, right? And then you start to realize, we, no, 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 we're doing this wrong. There's no point of approaching this from the common sense standpoint because there is no common sense. I feel like some of the things are definitely being implemented based on a plan. So they know what they're trying to do, and that's their agenda for whatever reason, right? Yeah. Because otherwise, it makes zero sense to do any of those things. Uh, uh, it's so strange. Just to chime in, and we definitely move off the crime. When there was all these robberies in South Africa, also, nothing was being done because you could cap this whole problem, you know, really, you could resolve it, you know, if you put your mind at it. But nothing was being right. done. Right. The solution is not that hard to, no. to find. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You put cameras on the streets, you you know, you put uh, police patrolling, you know, you make a plan you, to protect your citizens if you need to protect your citizens, you know. But what I realized was every time there was a robbery, uh, I would got so insurance paid out, you know, uh, you would go and buy new things. As you buy new things, value added tax or, you know, the 20% on top of the purchases get paid immediately back to the government. So the gov <laughs> every time there was a robbery, the government scores, the banks score because you take more credit. It's like everybody wins except that you just had a bad experience. It's so weird. Oh, yeah. 
yeah, it's it's, it's so we're no. trying to move move away from this, but it's so hard to move away because the more you speak or the more I speak, the more I can speak on it, right? It's almost and and that's the other thing I felt like uh, in U.S. as I got older and I started looking back at my life. I, f- I feel a little bit like cattle in the sense of that everything surrounding me, somebody's making money on it. And I'll give you an example. You know, American dream is you come, you go to school, you get a job, you buy a house, you get a pension, you retire, right? And then you can so I go to Thailand sc- on your retirement fund. Yeah, <laughs> right. So I go to school. Let's start with that. Most people cannot afford to go to school. They have to take out a loan to go to school they're in America, for example, uh, any decent, and you have to go to a decent school to get a good job, right? So you're paying between $10,000, $40,000, $50,000 a year to go to this university. Now you have a loan. So when you finish with school, you have to pay that off, but there is a percentage and tax on it, of course, because they're not giving you money for free. They, you have to pay back the APR, the percentage. So if you take, let's say you take out a hundred thousand dollar loan for your four year education, you paying back, you know, 5% every year on top of that because they make it money, right? Okay, so you got your education, you go to work. Now you're working, working, working. Everything around you is basically is there for you to consume. Everything, every commercial, everything around you is buy, 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 buy. And if you refuse to buy, especially when you're older, well, you're not on the same social status as your neighbor who's been buying, buying, buying. So now you're working, 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 buying, buying, buying. Every time you buy, there's a tax. But what's funny is if I buy something, there's a tax. I pay tax on that. And then if I choose to sell it on eBay or some second hand, there's another tax on that, even though I already paid a tax on that. So somebody's wow. making money off of that. Then I'm constantly working, right? I'm working. Uh, I'm trying to advance in my career. I'm, I want to buy a house, all that shit, all that stuff, excuse my language. And if you continue at that path, you're going to get sick. You're either going to get depression, you're either going to get overwork yourself. I mean, I'm not even talking about food or all these other things that are also in play. So what do you do now? You go to a doctor. Now you you have to have an insurance, whether your company provides it or if you if you don't if you, if you don't have a job that where that provides you with insurance, you're paying a lot of money out of pocket for that. So now the medication that costs five dollars in many places around the world costs you hundreds, and they charge insurance for it. So there's like this whole thing going on where they charge hundreds of insurance. So you only paying twenty dollars for this for the for these pills. Insurance pays hundred and fifty. But you paying every month to the insurance company hundreds, hundreds of dollars to keep that insurance. Mm-hmm. Then, they, then they give you all these pills. You get sick. Now you, or you're getting side effects. Now you're going back to the doctors for more stuff. So you're being farmed, and you be you're constantly paying your education back. You are paying your mortgage that you took out to buy a house back on that. Then you paying for all these pills. Then you pay, so you're constantly paying, and somebody's constantly making money all around you. And then you finally retire, get your pension if you're still alive, or God knows what else is happening. And so, is that really a life? It, it's almost like you were bred to work, 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 and buy, 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 pay, 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 and continue working because whatever money they give you, you give it right back in order to keep up. And I'm not saying everyone does it, and I'm not saying you have to do that, but it's hard not to, especially uh, if when you enter in the workforce in your 20s, you don't know any better. You only start to notice the trend after you lived a little bit, you know, getting in your 40s. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of the the society, how, how it works, uh, at least over there as far as medical system. And uh, I don't know if it's the same thing in South Africa, but medical system, schools, schools, uh, for example, uh, my my uh, friend, she was a doctor. She went to school for eight years. She said she owed three hundred thousand on uh, on her loans. Wow! Right. So, and until what so, age do people keep on paying their student loan? Until you pay it off. It's not the age. It's until until you give back what you borrowed. But like, what what's some of the stories you heard of? So you know, like, could you well, know? For ex- you know what the big mistake that happens? Um, a lot of people go to these uh, schools that cost a lot of money because of the name but their degrees are in 
uh, human resources or or something else where they cap at how much money they can earn. So if if I'm paying forty thousand dollars a year for uh, Ivy League school or something like that, but but my degree is in English literature, now I owe two hundred thousand dollars, but I'm making fifty thousand dollars a year, and then you take the taxes out, you only see twenty five. How the hell are you supposed to pay? You know, hundred thousand when you make twenty five a year or whatever, thirty a year, and then you still have to pay okay. your mortgage, you have to pay your rent, you have okay. to pay. So you'll be lucky if you'll pay five grand towards that loan or, or over a year, but every time it uh, clocks up five percent, which is a five grand on a hundred. So you actually stuck. Well, that gives me the answer. You could be paying your student loan to, uh, right until fifty, sixty years old if you're not, you know, really that financially well off. Well, that exactly. Also, if you're not financially educated, uh, so all the they don't really teach education as much as they should in schools, in my opinion. Everything you learn by yourself on the internet. So a lot of the people they don't even pay five thousand dollars a year. They pay bare minimum, meaning that you your uh, let's say it's a hundred thousand dollars you owe for your education, but you can make a minimal payment of hundred dollars a month. So people do that. They pay hundred dollars a month, and they don't have to think about it, but now it, it increases and increases and they do absolutely nothing in order to pay off that loan. So you, gotcha. you're basically you're just stuck paying in the this... interest. That's what yeah, happened to me in... with my home. Uh, sorry to interrupt, Alex. I paid off yeah, no, for the first 12 years because I wanted to keep up with the Joneses this ch to chime in with the social status. I got myself yeah. a three bedroom house at the age of 24. You know, like... You felt good I... though, right? You felt good. Oh, I felt good. I felt so big. Macho three bedroom house, although I could easily afford it a one bedroom flat cash at the time because I was having my own business and you know I was doing reasonably well. But no, I wanted a three bedroom house and a three floor, three story, not three bedroom, three story, story right. house. And um, yeah, for the first 12 years, I got, took a 25 year loan mortgage, and then for the first 12 years, I was just paying the interest. And then, like, things in my business turned sour. I didn't want to, you know, work so much anymore. And it's 12 and a half years later, you know, life changed <laughs> in that time. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and then the bank was always on me. It's like, and I had this le letters after letters that they were going to. Eventually, I, I, like, I walked out. Zoe and I, we just we took all the um solar panels and wherever i invested a hundred thousand dollars into permaculture tech uh eco technology solar panels batteries mm -hmm. everything like i got my home off the grid you know fully off the grid and uh we stripped wherever we could strip and we walk out and just left the keys in the house and and the, the bank obviously absorbed it and i'm it's absolutely getting, getting emails to still pay off the full loan the full loan in 12 years i paid the amount of the house and the one they they block, clocked me up for the same figure which this you know i just yeah i couldn't you know but but that's what happens people enter the market enter the economy being uneducated about how everything works because they're either young or they come from a different country from a different culture and they they don't understand i have a lot of people writing me when i made when i made my video how we decided to move right because i want a simpler life and everything else they're like alex i want to do the same thing but i can't i own a loan on my house i own loan on my education i i have all these things i have to pay off i cannot i can't even leave uh, i don't have any money to leave unless they just you know declare bankruptcy or something but even then there's there's so you're you're being absorbed by car payment loan payment uh medicare payment uh so what you're payment, saying is uh, they will not let you pass the border to get out if you have all that loan am i true am i correct in saying that um well, no, it I think it depends. I mean, obviously, if you get on a plane tomorrow and you leave everything behind. Uh, but I guess what I'm trying to say, though, is that people have so many bills. They are stuck in the system of paying off. They would love to pay everything off, get whatever, sell whatever they can and just leave. Right. But they, they can't. They can't afford to pay everything off anymore, mm -hmm. uh, whether they don't make enough money or so the system kind of. The system keeps adding, adding, adding to you as a consumer for you to buy, 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 buy until your quality of life. I mean, your cost of living goes so much that you constantly have to work in order to keep up with your lifestyle. Right. People that are educated, they see that and then they 
and live within their means. But the system there is teaching you to make yourself feel good. And how are you compared to other people around you? That's how you measure success. That's very interesting that you said that because uh, what uh, my wife, uh, Zoya, she figured out, and I mean, it's no news, but you know, the, the way you feel about yourself is in direct relation of how you want to buy these things to bump, to bump yourself up. So you work, work, work. You feel worse, worse, worse because, you know, a 12-hour yep. working day is just no good. So you think by buying this and that will get you feeling better. So you get yourself a nicer car, although your car is still fine. You get yourself a better house and then you are chained to more debt. Uh, so but it's even like then, a perpetual stories like a perpetual vacuum hole, black hole. See, that's even the other thing that I realized later on in life is that even when you get yourself a brand new car, a brand new house, how long does that last? How long does that feeling last? A month. A month. A month. And then that car is not so new anymore, right? So that's, I think that's what kind of started for me. I realized happiness and all that comes from within. Right, it comes from within. You don't really need so many things to be happy. Once you find your happiness, everything around you is different. But look how many people are millionaires and they're depressed. Everything that if you work, 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 of course, and that's the other thing that happens when you constantly work and you finally get a break for a day or two. What do you do? You need to do something to let that, you know, let off some steam or make sure you that stress comes off of you. Right? Yeah. For me, so it what was do you a do? joint every evening. Every evening, right. I, w I would roll a little joint. I'd go to that place where I took Zoya, where they we got kicked out, and I'd look over the city's lights, and I'd smoke my toke, and and and, and I was like, ah, oh. it was like a pressure yeah. release mechanism. <laughs> and then night. you start counting days until Monday, and you have to go back to work. Yeah, no, <laughs> but I would do it every day in the evening. I was living in this half drunken state. Uh, half the time I even lost on the way back home after in the hard city where I lived for 25 years. I would drive around, couldn't find it. I mean, that's how stoned you get. It's, it, it kills your well, brain. Well, that's just, and I think like that's like the small scale. You know, that joint doesn't cost that much. But then other people, what they do is when they work, like that, now they're buying a car that you said, they're going on a trip, they're spending thousands just to make themselves feel better, just to show something for the work that they've put in, right? So you end up in this perpetual cycle of, Working, 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 and then consuming, spending that money, working, working, but nothing keeps you happy, satisfied, or mentally stable uh, for a long or for a consistent amount of time or consistently. Because whatever new thing you buy, eventually that novelty wears off, or that joint that you smoke that wears off, and you're back in the real world. So, yeah. the, the 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 metaphor for the joint it could be any material thing. Mm, exactly. Just to make it, it's almost like a drug, whatever you, you know, end up doing. So, Alex, let's relocate now to Russia. So, eventually, you, so you went on, a, on this uh, holiday, you were quite impressed. So, what made you guys like realize, oh my God, so we're leaving now? We're not just going on a holiday, we're freaking leaving. So, uh, a lo lo short answer, COVID. Short. Long, an yeah. long short answer, answer, short answer, COVID. Uh -huh. Long answer, Long answer is we when we came back from New York from Moscow, mm -hmm. we said you know what, I we're gonna move there. We're gonna move back when I get my pension when I'm 65 or 62. I'm, we're gonna get a pension and we're gonna move there and we're gonna retire there because we liked it so much. Mm -hmm. Cool. Then um, things started to degrade in the states and, and and we could talk about that all day between schools and what they teach you except it's you know who believes into what whatever your upbringing is long LGBT story short but, agenda yeah all of that all of that gotcha all of, all of that so so and my wife's a teacher so she saw how her classrooms changed the books that they were given the give meetings that they had to go give us an example well, for, it. for example the um you know, the books that they started reading was you know, the LGBT stuff was being pushed into the curriculum of the school. Now the boys, you know, back in the day, it was a boy playing with a dog or something. Now, and the moral of the story is that maybe you need to share your things with your friends. Now the moral of the story is it's okay if you're, if you don't feel like you're a male. Now you, you can change your gender or in the school skin books. color. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Uh, then, then there's this whole division of like race. Race is a very big subject in America. Um, 
you know, if you're white, you're considered that you you contributed to slavery, even though like I came from Russia, we don't have any slaves. We never did any of that. But it's everywhere. But you know what? You again, you start to approach that from common sense standpoint and you're like, well, why is wh why are you telling me this? I'm not from except but eventually get to a point you're like, I'm not playing this game anymore. Mm -hmm. I can see through this whole thing. And what this is, is division. It's division based on your skin color. It's division based on your religion. It's division based on uh, social status. Every, basically, everything is there to divide you and for you to take sides. Uh, mm -hmm. sides. And then it's for you to hate the other person or compete with the other person. Yes. Um, yes. So anyway, to get back to your, to your question, all those things started to happen. I remember COVID hit mm -hmm. and uh, we were working from home for, for almost two years. Uh, we couldn't obviously travel anywhere. And that changed my mindset. I'm like, wait, this is not life. Me, uh, you know, I, I mileage wise, I lived, I think like six to seven miles from where I worked, which is what, I don't know, 15 kilometers or something like that. It's not a long distance driving a car. But because of the traffic in New York, it would take me sometimes an hour, hour and a half to get to work one way and then another hour get back. So I'm realizing what is going on here. I'm spending almost three hours out of my day um, uh, commuting. Then, you know, and, and that's on top of everything else that's going on. So once COVID ended, we went back to Russia mm -hmm. again. And at that point, my parents moved back. And I remember we went to visit them and we went back and everything was so different there you know first of all i'm from new york city of course I, and people tell me you, sh you could move to a different state and you know do all those things and as far as nature so when we went back there's nature that see the life was so much just simpler you know what i mean right. like uh you know i'm talking about crimea but some roads were messed up or they would sometimes they would turn off the water or sometimes the lights would go out while we were there. It happened like twice for whatever reason. And like none of those things bothered me, right? But then as I'm over there and I'm reading the news in the States, and again, that's the, my other issue is I was reading the news. Everything in the news is there to divide and paint this bleak picture. So you're constantly yeah. depressed. We were just sitting there and we're like, I did not feel stressed. I did not feel depressed. Why or any of those feelings? Why were we here? If anything, we walked around everywhere. Like you mentioned, in, in when you guys wanted to go for a walk, we would hike up to the woods. We would go to the beach. We would just and everything around us was also very simple. You know, nobody harassed you. No, nobody harassed me. But no, no, nobody harassed me. But even like sometimes, you know, people might be rude because of the difference in in Russian culture. Or it was just, it, it was simple. Everything around me was simple. If somebody's not happy with me. I would see it, you know, people would show it, but it was just a simple life. And I, I didn't have to, first of all, I didn't have to fear for my safety. Um, that was like a big change. I also mentally was, uh, I found, I felt at ease. Right. And I remember the time was coming back and I told my wife, what are we doing? Why are we like, when I'm in New York, so, oh, I apologize. My, my thoughts all over the place. So this is what really happened. I noticed the difference how I feel when I lived in U.S. and how I when yeah, so I was like in tightness, this tightness, right? It completely disappeared. And if if I didn't move, if I didn't visit Russia, I would never, I would have never known that, and I would never, I would have never known that that's what I need in, in my life. Mm -hmm. But because I did. And me, I spoke to my wife, and she felt the same way. She felt at ease, like it's a different type of life. I said, yeah, I don't want to go back to that. And I told her, listen, what if we just sell everything? What if we just sell everything? She's like, well, okay, but hold on. Let's talk about this. You're going to sell everything, but what about our jobs? What about this? I'm like, I don't know. We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. You know, um, so we kind of. We thought about it for maybe a day. We said, let's do it. So we literally went back and we sold everything within two months. And I'm talking about cars, our apartment. We found a container. Um, it was a whole big to do, right? And it seemed impossible, but like doing things one day at a time. Yeah, uh, no, living just, in a Western world, you accumulate a lot of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and, and let me tell you, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but let me tell you something. 
<laughs> as we were doing all this, we were scared. We were very scared. We're like, what are, are we making the right move? You know, are we what are we doing here? Are we making um the right decision? But I would stop and I would think, okay, if I stay here, my health is go I was very heavy. I was very, very heavy. All I did after work was, you know, either drink or eat because that was my 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 safe. My, something like for you was a joint for me it's sit in front of a computer finally relax play some video game order some food have that like it was not a life you know what i mean and even relationship with my wife was it was not the best because of how i felt i i was not open to anything she said alex let's go let's go for a walk i i, I was just in this negativity right in, in this negative mind state which which now i realize is because i was watching the news i was because i'm i'm at that point i'm constantly like i need to look out for my family i need to be ready god forbid something happened like what's happening with the taxes okay so insurance is going up so we have to pay for that staying on top of all these laws they're doing all Just these consume. calculations constantly all the time yeah 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 We're foreseeing into it the was, future yeah yep exactly i was living in the future i I was living literally in the future. I was not living in the now, right? The concept of now, I learned later on once I moved. But for them, I was living when we get our pension at 65, we're going to do things, right? And then okay. one day it was like, that, Alex, I'm like, I have to pause you there. It's so interesting. Like I have two good American friends. And what I'm noticing about American culture is that they – constantly saying like next year things will improve like uh, the bitcoins will go up and you know uh, <laughs> yeah like like things will get better uh, you know the just now just like like the 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 biden will get off and then or whatever the trump will come back or whatever but things will be better next year and you know if i keep on seeing the pattern they've been saying that for four or five years I think they're getting worse and worse and worse. In fact, it's like exponentially worse. And I, yeah, yeah. So you've also noticed that that you 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 keep on living of dreaming of the future, but not in, on but fearing the present. Well, see, I, I think the main thing here uh, that I took away when I looked at this my situation, it's not you have to keep hope, right? So of course you're gonna live thinking things will improve, but. It really hit me when I realized the last three years I'm living in the past. I'm 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 fantasizing. I'm thinking. I'm dreaming about these good times that will come at a later point. It's been three years, nothing came, but I'm not in the moment. I'm not enjoying this weather that's outside. I'm not enjoying this time with my wife, for example. Or I'm not I'm not living in the moment because the future and the past they don't exist. The only thing that exists is really right now, me and you. What's tomorrow might come. It might not come. It might come differently. So I was like, holy shit, what, what is happening with my life? And when we're coming back, even from, from Russia, I remember I was in an airport and I see all these elderly people being wheeled in. It was like uh, six or seven wheelchairs back to back being by these people pushed in. And I remember I, I came up and I asked them, I said, what is this? Is this some kind of a like I didn't say something. I just said, "What is this?" And they told me this is like an elderly trip where people can uh, sign up and everything's taken care of for them, uh, taking care for them. So they have guides in the airport. They put them on a plane, then they land somewhere in a different country. They show them, and I'm looking at them, and nothing. You know, I'm not judging them. They could have lived the most amazing life. We're all getting old, right? But mm -hmm. I knew for a fact that I was not living that amazing life. And then if I have to live my life on a wheelchair, 65 years from now, or I mean, 30, 40 years from now. That resonated with me as well. And I said, you know what? Forget forget that security. Forget that dream. Forget all of that. I need to make a change now because otherwise my life, I'm getting older. I'm not happy, you know, and, and nothing's working. You know, I've been meaning to lose weight for the last 20 years not, or 15 years at that point. I keep, oh, I can't, I can't, but I can't. So we just kind of uh, said this needs to be done. This needs to be done for a relationship. This needs to be done for our health. This needs to be done for our future, and we'll figure it out. Things always worked out, right? And when we finally made the move, I'm telling you, uh, people ask me, like, do you regret it? Or uh, Sometimes I read these comments, people wishing me, like, oh, you'll be back, or all of this stuff. Dude, everything I told you just now, how I felt, I thought I needed this. I had no idea how much I needed this until it was actually done and we were there. That's when I was like, oh my God, thank God we made this decision. Because financially right now, 
we don't have as much security as we did when I worked on an amazing job with a pension, right? Um, the future is not promised as far as, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but this is the happiest I've ever been. I've been, I've been living in the moment. Um, it, it's been the most amazing journey. And I'm, I'm sitting here sometimes, you know, people say things, when something happens, is it good? Is it bad? When COVID happened, my wife is like, this is horrible. And, you know, uh, she was all into all of that. Sorry, I'm starting to ramble. But the point I'm trying to make is that COVID was... All of that meaning definitely... vaccine and RMNA, all of that. Uh... Yeah, but I'm saying COVID was actually a very good thing for us. Without yeah, it, we would have never made the move. That's we also moved us... during COVID. That's when I walked out of the house. I couldn't sell it. Because of COVID, I couldn't sell my house. Otherwise, I would have gladly sold it and at least walked out with something. But COVID, people were like unsure of a future, a big fear. And sale, obviously, the property market went right down. And I bought in 2007 at the peak of the property market before 2008. Mm. So my house price was way up. <laughs> and then I over-invested into, with all my permaculture tech, which nobody wants. It's like putting on right. a second-hand BMW uh, diamond uh, mags and you know right. golden the golden steering wheel like nobody's interested it's still a second hand bmw from bmw right. you know Nobody 1992 the that's the price buddy <laughs> so that's yeah. interesting so covid was really really cool but let's bring the people right down what challenges did you have when you came to russia oh man so and i'll share with mine as well yeah, so the challenge is obviously the move, getting the container and all that. But that's like small stuff. That's small stuff. Um, and we already visited twice, so we kind of we knew what was going on. Like we we knew the expectations, but now we're there, not on a, a vacation. Now we have to come in, and now we have to move and start a new life there, right? So when we moved there permanently, um, first six months we were just decompressing from that life. We were like, I can't believe everything is, you know, we're not thinking about working. We're just waking up every day, going for walks, relaxing. Um, and then after six months, the first challenge that we faced was after we decompressed was like, okay, what now? What now? Because we don't really have a purpose now. We moved. We feel better, but we're not working. We're not, what, is my, what is our purpose? And we started to look for a job. Uh, my wife, thankfully, she's a teacher, so she was able to work on the side. But for me, the big challenge was, who am I now? I was I worked in a big company. Um, I was in charge of projects. People answered to me. I answered to other people. Now I'm just a guy. You're a project manager? A different... Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I, I worked for a railroad. I, I worked for a railroad as a train dispatcher, and then I moved to uh, management. Gotcha. Afterwards. Yeah. And so the first challenge was like a mental challenge, which I, which I did not anticipate. Was that I? Who am I? And uh, what's my self worth? And so it was like a me little mental issue with that. Uh, of course, the language. Uh, my wife faced issues with the language. First of all, she felt pretty far away from her family, which is in South America mm -hmm. uh, or United States. The other thing is, of course, she pretty much without me because she does not speak the language. But we both agree, obviously we. Again, the things that I'm talking about, we knew solutions right away. We just had to go through these things before we able to resolve them. So for her, the resolution is learn Russian. If you learn the language, you won't be depending on me. But she did not feel like she was uh, her own adult, her, her own person. Everything had to, we had to be together. Eventually, she started making friends, etc. Um, of course, then there's the money situation with the sanctions and everything that's going on. Yeah. Um, when uh, the military operation happened and the sanctions were introduced, um, you couldn't transfer money anymore. That was yeah, a yeah. big challenge uh, in itself. We were never challenged where we were like, oh, uh, maybe we made a mistake. Maybe maybe we should go back. Never, 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 never. It's yeah. more like, okay, we'll figure this out. We'll figure this out. And then, of course, what, what, what allowed me... Uh, the move allowed me to get into uh, the spiritual state of mind. I discovered myself a lot, and then I improved the way I think. So the more challenges came, the the less we kind of already learned how to deal with everything and just keep moving forward. I you know, also thought that uh, the country is going to be this sugar-coated. Everything is going to be amazing. Russia is a super uh, 
uh, it's just going to solve all my problems. So right. the first thing, obviously, I had also a lot of stuff. I had a car in South Africa. I had a house. You know, although it's a colonial, you know, it's under colony, you know, it's a colonial type of country. It's still, like, I had my joint. I had I had some friends, you know, and I come here and I get nothing. I, uh, in your case, you took a container. I priced the container cost and I couldn't afford a container because by the time I was leaving South Africa, I was close to bankruptcy because I already did seven trips to Russia over two years yeah. because, you know, my visa kept on running out because I didn't have my passport, uh, which I had to re, you know, so every, every time I had a three months visa, I had to leave, stay back oh, in man, South yeah. Africa for three months and then come back. And I, you know, and I, anyway, so um, the biggest challenge was that I come from a car and a life that I know to a bicycle. So I'm cycling yeah. for, uh, to go to the well, like a public well where I could fill up some water and I have nothing, you know, like I, although I have an online job where I teach people how to build eco homes and, and, and that's going fine. At oh, the, that's so cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All to American market, most American and Canadian. Oh, they, they love that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, 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 so I've got lots of American uh, so subscribers and stuff which will be watching this. It'll be very interesting to hear their opinion. But the biggest, ch so, so f the, the, you, you were right. So, uh, in terms of like, there's no pressure. There is uh, milk. We were staying in the village. We actually moved already like four times in the last uh, three for four years. Uh, even yeah, so it was really a lot of moving. So I within within Russia. Within Russia, Zoya had a home on the other side of St. Petersburg, 60 miles hmm. on the other side of St. Petersburg from where we are, where I'm sitting in right now. I'm now on the other side of St. Petersburg from where we're also about 60 miles. So first thing I was like, no, we got to leave. It's too, too dense, too close, too many people. Although we were, went even in the city, we were in our own home. Zoya had her own beautiful wooden Suburbs. Home. Like Dacha. Dacha. So, Dacha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So we had maybe on two sides, we didn't even have neighbors. I complained, too dense. So we moved to a village with two neighbors. So then one neighbor was really got a bit iffy with me. And eventually he took a rifle and shot in the air to try and scare me. So we sold that house eventually. And we ran from there. And I ran to Siberia. Oh, no, sorry, before I went to Siberia, then we ran to another place. We bought also another property <laughs> uh, in an abandoned village with no people, no neighbors, just like we could be. And I went crazy because I thought my whole life that if, you know, always, all my life I stayed in cities. In Moldova, I stayed in Rybnica. Right. City, mm -hmm. Then I moved to Moscow at the age of 10 until 14. I stayed in a big city. Then I moved to Johannesburg for 25. So, I had city up in my neck. I kept on thinking that when I get to nature, then things are going to get better. And I already had an experience in 2011 when I moved to a land in South Africa where we had to tie it up with a gun, with a with an axe and a hammer. I had seven hectares on a beautiful sunny slope and next to indigenous forests in the so southern mm -hmm. of South Africa or, or not far from the coast. So really good. And, and I was also uh, not... Uh, uh, like not very comfortable inside my like my that's feel, not feeling inner peace. And so when I we moved to nature, an abandoned village here in two years ago, um, we were renting a beautiful Logan home and we bought a property in this village and no people. And eventually, I nearly went crazy because and I realized that living in the most amazing nature does not mean you're going to be happy. Because when you are social beings, we need people. Eventually, the the landlord who was renting us the home, you know, kicked us out. Told us he's selling the house, which he didn't. And we moved to a nearby town in Pskovska Oblast. And Pskov is between Saint Petersburg, the hub, and Moscow, the hub. And this is like a nowhere land, meaning like poor, 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 poor area. Like anyway, what we realize is the further you move from megapolises, from these giant cities, the further you move away from them into, like, you know, right, the big Russia, like, you know, the right. land, the less people are consciously evolved. So where, like, like 
60 miles from St. Petersburg, like I could do anything here. Nobody cares because everybody minds their own business. Everybody is busy. You move out there where you might have a neighbor that's two miles away. That neighbor will be sniffing around and checking what are you up to because for them, you're like the new TV station. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, uh, there's nothing to do. Suddenly there are pigs and cows. Uh, which you can milk <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, 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 you know, uh, so we got our milk, fresh milk. It was still hot from the, you know, the, yeah, udders. The, yeah, 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 the udders of the cow, the cream on top. I got amazing cream. Like they scooped this cream right from the top. Like the produce was really good. Like, you know, the stuff you pay in America, top dollar. Right, but, right. But the state of consciousness of people was so... I'm not saying I'm higher or lower. I'm not judging, but it was different. There's different levels. You guys were it there was, in it, a different it, it places. Was different levels. What what was interesting to them? Uh, have a drink and uh, talk about things that went interesting to me. Exactly. You know. Exactly. Uh, le less educated and uh, whatever. Um. So we found that uh, even the people that were there, we couldn't really communicate with them. And we kept on traveling. I kept on traveling to Moscow just so I could meet somebody, you know, to have a conversation. So it would cost me a lot of money and a lot of time to get on a train and, and travel. Right, that right. Was, that was the biggest challenge. The second challenge is also a job. Like, I, you know, first of all, I don't want to, you know, like, uh, uh, I guess I'm used to a different type of money getting, although the prices are very different here. So there's total freedom. There's no building codes, Alex. You can do what you want, build what you want. Up oh, there are no 20, building codes? No building codes. You can build really? up to 20, 20 meters tall. You can build anything you want, move in at any stage of the build, whether the house is finished or not, whether it has water or not, whether it has electricity or not. You can move into this home and stay there, whether you put a tent and camp in it, whatever. And that's what that's I'm so doing right now. I'm like living in this home I built. It was minus 30 the other day. So it was ice forming on my windows. But, you know, I'm I'm here. I'm, so I guess the job, like I'm struggling to, 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 to find myself like financially in this country, you know. Uh, and then yeah. I just thought, I, you know, I needed, because when we were staying in this uh, uh, Pskovska Oblast, an abandoned village, I was so lonely. You know, although I had my wife, yeah. we need other people. So I ran to this uh, community. The sect was 5,000 people who back in the 90s all relocated out of the big cities, the scientists, the you know, philosophers, great people. They all relocated out following this guru who claimed himself as the second Christ called Vesorion. He's in jail right now. And uh, basically... Yeah, they, exactly. He told them. Oh he told them that he's Jesus. He's the second one. The first one was two thousand years back, and he's now the the the, the same one back in. He grew his long hair. He was a cop at a time. So anyway, I I knew that like I wasn't resonating, but I thought five thousand people, interesting people, all within a bicycle ride, in the most amazing nature next to Altai. I'm sure you've seen some Altai. Yeah, Lake Baikal behind gorgeous. me. So yep. beautiful mountains, a river that's 300 feet wide, that's fully drinkable, Russian river, 300 feet wide, the most, the cleanest water you can find on earth. So all of that was visit. very enticing. So it was a fourth time. And a year, last year, it wasn't even that far back, last year, June, no, no, not last year, the 2022 June is when I moved there. I told Zoya, Zoya, I have to go. She filed for divorce. We nearly ended up a relationship and I realized, oh my God, these are just mentally sick people that haven't developed themselves. Like in a normal world, like normal, like, you know, people hustle and bustle and there's still some form of spiritual growth. Like you just mentioned that. Right. You know, it's the difficulties, but you're like finding yourself and you know, you, you, right. you find who you are and spiritually you're growing. There, people like froze their spiritual growth because they, they were promised that if they stay next to Jesus, <laughs> the fake Jesus, uh, you know, and yeah, yeah, yeah. under his protection, then, then they don't need to read anything, they don't need to develop. Uh, in fact, that burning sensation inside that, you know, sometimes you get that like burn inside your heart chakra. He's, yeah, they like said it's burn. good, it will burn away. So they burned right through 
suicide level is extremely high, especially like 30 year old, 30 young men, young boys, 25, 30 suicides, quite a few for yes. a small community. Yeah, people are killing because suicide is approved. It says it's the right thing to do if you don't feel like you, you know, because you, whatever, you know, the, the reason they give them. So suicide is accepted. So it's just crazy. So we nearly lost my relationship. And eventually I saw that people just, you know, like these, all these thousands of people, I felt just as lonely there. And eventually I realized, oh my God, what am I doing? So I went back to Zoya and I apologized and I'm back in and we bought now 60 miles on the other side of ja uh, St. Petersburg, a plot of land next to indigenous forest, beautiful forest right here and a builder's Gothic arch with a glazing on the northern side, nice. which looks at the forest and the glazing on the south side, which looks onto our garden. And uh, wow. Yeah. So, so we're like, and St. Peter, and the train station is a seven minute walk. I jump on a super comfy train with a table, air conditioning, and I, within an hour and 30 minutes, I'm in St. Petersburg, which is the second largest city in, uh, in Russia. Lots of culture, lots of theater, like everything, you know? And we're really glad. And I realized that it's not the city that, that makes us feel bad. It's exactly it's that happiness comes from inside. And you so can, are you happy now? I daily daily inner spiritual work very specific work that uh uh zoya co-developed and uh, analytical work I start my day with a question of what is bothering me right now and through that question i unwrap um some things and i do a little process a bit of writing and i work good, good. but daily daily inner work otherwise I, I i still spiral out believe it or not if i if i oh, don't human. do the work yeah so Listening to your story, I could relate to pretty much almost every aspect of it. And my first, uh, the first thing I noticed, and this is what happened with me, is that you kept going from place to place because you put happiness in a place. When you move to Russia, you'll be happy. Oh, you're not happy? When you move 60 miles away, you'll be happy. Oh, you're not happy. When you move back to the city, you'll be happy, right? Um, but that's exactly, it's, happiness is not a place, Happiness comes from within. And to be honest with you, I could go back to the United States again right now and be able to live there because now I'm living in my own world, in my own happiness. I just choose to not to because why would I? There's way better places and quality of life for me. But at the same time, uh, also the, ask, uh, the loneliness, I can so relate. Even right now, I, I can relate being in Vietnam. You know, I, I How do my you own end thing up here. in Vietnam? I, <laughs> We're oh. talking about Russia. What the hell? <laughs> yeah, we're in Vietnam right now. So uh, what happened was my wife, um, she applied for a visa. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, not a visa. She applied for her citizenship. Uh, no, um, not not a citizen. I keep saying citizenship, but it's um it's residency. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and we had a slight issue where she has – in America, we have what's called a middle name. So you, she could be uh, – she could be Lauren – uh lauren i don't know nicole johnson on mm -hmm. her passport and then she's going to be lauren johnson on her, middle name is like not an official thing yeah it is official you can you can you can put it on you can admit it so she has that on, on her passport and something else on a marriage certificate so when we applied the russia's like you are two different people wow. you need to uh, you, you can't have one name here and that's two different people so you need to prove that you're the same person so how do we do that there's no paperwork for that so what ended up happening is we had to go back to the United States and we had to change her name on her passport and her marriage certificate so that they align. But my wife was married before. She had a different marriage and she took her, her name of her husband. So there's another name in the picture there that's different. So we had to get a lawyer who basically would go. And that's the other thing, too. When you get married, you get a marriage certificate. When you get divorced in America, you give it back. And they give you a divorce certificate. But we had to track down the original marriage certificate that they don't give you. You have to ask for a lawyer. To, it, it was a whole complete mess without. That costs a like lot a of proper, money probably. Yeah, proper instructions. First of all, it's not like we said, okay, you need this paper, go and get it. We were like, what do we do now? So we found a lawyer. The lawyer was working through all these different things. Cost a lot of money. So what ended up happening, the process was taking a long time and money. Uh, so we were thinking, okay, we need. We need an income. We need to start making money. 
And I found out about international teaching. My wife's been a teacher her whole life. Uh, she has master's degree in education, uh, a lot of experience, and uh, she was able to get a job in Vietnam, uh, a good job. So we ended up moving here while we were going through the process. But the problem here is that uh, you have to sign a contract, a two-year contract. Mm -hmm. So for us, it was basically, um, you know, we have to put a hold on our move now in order, but now we have a stable income coming in. Gotcha. Because that's the other thing. You you have your plans. You're going to move. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. You have a certain amount of money. And you make things happen. And then that plan kind of falls apart a little bit. Now you have to improvise. Now you have to. So we were we were able to get a job here. But everything works works out for a reason. Because now she's getting even uh, better experience here in these international schools that actually Russia absolutely loves. So our our plan is once this contract runs out, to sign a contract so that it would help her with her paperwork, whereas she can move there as a skilled worker. Gotcha. And if you move there as a skilled worker, you you can stay in the country, but also after uh, two years, you get your citizenship like this. Actually, the, the new law was passed as of January 1st, a couple of days ago. What law? Uh, it, the law where skilled workers can get the citizenship much quicker as long as they and come to Russia and, and they fulfill their contract. Perfect. So there's and there's a whole list of these skills that they accept. There's a whole bunch of IT. I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah. There's a whole list yes, of elements. yes. Yeah, yeah. Te teachers is one of them. What happens is the schools pay for your flights. They pay for your. Uh, it, it's a nice package, basically. Yeah. It's a very good package. So we're looking at it from a different standpoint now. You know that that's a different way for us to go back, where she doesn't have to worry about visas or any of that, and then she'll get her citizenship eventually. A uh, residency. It's a permanent residency through that. Not okay. not a citizenship a residency, um. But anyway, going back to what you were saying, so loneliness, loneliness. that wasn't that thing. Oh my god, I'm still struggling to this. That's why I started my YouTube channel. I needed an outlet, right? I love my wife, but there's some things you can't even talk to your wife about because it's not that she, not that you can't say it or she won't understand. It's just you need other people. You need your friends. You need just a different perspective. Um, and that's something that I also was struggling with. Not in Russia, actually. I had I had good friends in Russia. Um, I actually have a friend there that we we were good friends when I moved at twelve, and then we reconnected twenty five years later. Um, but since we moved to Vietnam, you know, I'm studying. I was studying IT here, and then I'm doing something else. And I've met some people here and there, but like you said, we were just not. Um, how should I say this? Our energies just weren't compatible. You know, even though they were great people. I just didn't feel like, I don't know, maybe hanging out with them as much, or we didn't have as much in common, even though they were absolutely nice people. So there's this um, this loneliness that eats at you, and then it, it adds to your depression or whatever you want to call it at that point. So, it, and, and I think eventually all of us fall into this self-improvement and spirituality and work, and then you start to find yourself, what do I want to do, you know? Now I'm also realizing that I can actually now do something that where I wake up every day and go after it and be happy about it opposed to saying, oh, it's it's my job and I just have to grind through it type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, You're also working well, as so, a teacher. Um, yes and no. So yes, I am. But I, I, I started it. Uh, I work. I, I guess it's a tutor or a teacher. Yes, I'm working with a company right now, actually. they uh, It's an IT company. Mm -hmm. But they had uh, they have five employees and they need help with business English. Uh, because I worked in a corporate world and uh, for 17 years, um, I'm helping them basic. They, they have a basic understanding of English. I'm helping them with uh, more business words, sentences, how it works. You know, there's all kinds of jargon, jargons and gotcha. uh, different things. And then, of course, uh, teaching here as well is very uh, it pays a lot more than basically anything else. Because Vietnam's cost of living is so low, and the salaries reflect that as well. So if you're if you're doing IT, if you're a computer programmer, they don't make much money. But if you're if you come from America or you come you a native speaker, uh, it's more of an emphasis uh, on salary and a better package. Okay. Okay. And um, Alex, sorry, I apologize. Yeah, I apologize. I forgot your original question, so I'm kind of rolling. No, no, with no. It. <laughs> you, 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 you're answering. That's fine. We'll edit uh, the stuff. That's not. Uh, you know, we'll put it all together. But I guess a really good question would be, like, now that we know there is a, some agenda, uh, not definitely some agenda. We know that uh, in certain in America and in Canada, 
you know, Europe, um, you know, the, the transgender where they cut, uh, you know, it's accepted to for a boy to turn into a girl and vice versa. Uh, in some places uh, already, if parents are against it, they are, the kids can be taken away and have that yep. operation. In U.S. as well. Yeah, in some US states as... are passing those laws. Some states yeah. are passing those laws. If you speak against it, you get a, you know, police come to your house and then they start looking into things. And then some states pass in laws where you don't need a parental consent. A child that's nine, 10 years old can make their own decision. Yeah. So we understand. So a lot of people, most people are starting to understand that this is BS. This is not right because a child at the age of 10 cannot make a conscious decision. And 99% of the time, if 999, 10, 20 years later, these people are depressed, they can't urinate properly, uh, they're having pains, they're committing high suicide, there's a high suicide rate because they're so depressed, yeah. because they're not a man or woman, like God knows what, they can't have uh, sexual intercourse with their lover, they don't believe what they believed at the age of 10, but you know, the operation is permanent, you know, like, you know, Brain, it's, it's brainwashing. Sewing a penis back on ain't going to make it work like it used to work when it was came from God, you know? Yeah. And when you're looking at it culturally, everything in US in the last, I want to say, 70 years revolves around that. And that's what makes it cool. You have kids acting like it or they using different pronouns just based on the fact that it's cool. They don't even, they, 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 they supposed to, they feel like they're supposed to feel like that i'm supposed to be non-binary i'm supposed to be you know what i mean like maybe back in the day a couple of people felt that way and that was it now mm -hmm. everyone's even if now it's almost like if i don't feel like that there's something wrong, wrong with me i should sure. be open-minded to that point which is absolutely yeah crazy and then you, you, you say a word non-binary in russia or vietnam or <laughs> somewhere people will look at you like oh, what <laughs> you know what i mean so traditional but, values husband and wife mother and child in fact in russia 2024 is a year of family and so we have all these billboards all over where uh husband wife and a kid and they're putting presents onto this christmas tree you know uh dressing up mm -hmm. the christmas tree so it's really a family orientated and they're celebrating it this whole year celebrating family in a traditional sense good 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 yeah that was one of the main reasons why we also said, I don't want to raise my kid in the U.S. where tomorrow might not even have a say. They'll take it, take the kid away, right? Uh, because I'm not following the agenda. And and just to touch up on something, I want to make it clear. You know, I we had gay people. We had even trans. I've heard of trans growing up back in the day, right? And I, I'm going to use Vietnam as a good example. There are gay people here. And even though I'm sure they're like ladyboys in Thailand or something like that. But it just seems it's organic. There's no media session around it. It's not in your face. It's not being advertised. It's basically organic in the sense of that. They do their at thing. Least, and... From what I noticed, yeah, people fall into that because of how they feel, and that's it. But in the U.S., I feel like they weaponized. They took people that felt a certain way, and now it's in your face everywhere. Every movie, every TV show, everything around it is basically being shoved down your throat. Yeah, schools in Europe yeah. shut down for the pride, uh, you know, when yeah. they walk okay. along. The, 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 yeah, yeah, and you, ha you have even plenty of people speaking out against it because it's not what they stand for. Or now you have people acting a certain way when they're not. You yeah, know, yeah. so you, they, they almost weaponized uh, a state of being that's very small minority were... Now it's shoved down everybody's throat, and if you don't agree with that, you're wrong, or you're some type of way. Which where's the freedom in that? Where's the freedom of choice? Where's freedom of anything? Yeah, the other day I heard another blogger that was, uh, uh, you know, speaking. He, he was lying, not a blogger. He was interviewing another guy that came from Canada and also speaking speaking some horror stories. He was lying in in this hospital, struggling to breathe. <laughs> this people came no i'm not you know with flags and they're saying guys we're going to repaint your hospital right now and they take out the paints and they started painting rainbows in all the rooms now you can imagine your line was COVID. the lung capacity is somewhat i lost about 30 percent after COVID of my lung capacity and i had tb wow. so i couldn't breathe you know now right. suddenly they're taking out acrylic 
you know, toxic paints and they're painting the whole rooms. Uh, oh, so it smells like chemicals from the paint yes, as well. Yes, and then, so somebody complained. This guy who was being interviewed complained, and he says it was like a blockbuster. They took him. They took all his things. They gave it to him and said, "Go." By the time he reached downstairs in the lift, there was a car that took him, handcuffed him, and took him into jail. And they harassed him for, you know, uh, I don't want to lie, but they harassed him for some time. Eventually, let him go. And then he's like, okay, time to get out of Canada. You know what I mean? So he left and he shared the story. Uh, I mean, if, we, if you're interested, Zoe will send you, you know, mm -hmm. who it was. Because, she, yeah, it, it's just, uh, it is being weaponized. So, Alex, now, the, so now that, like, us normal people, okay, like, and it's not about nations. You know, it's not about American or Russian or Vietnamese we are the people who are the same people. We want love. We want to have our family, children. You right. Know, we want to communicate. We we'll all feel like uh, loneliness. We want to make friends. We're humans. We're humans. We're humans. Now, we're feeling like there is a war going up against us by some chosen ones that believe that there needs to be a billion people, the billion on the planet, and the 500 million needs to serve it you know, be in service, and the others, like, there's no place for them, you know? We know the mm -hmm. story, generally. What would you recommend to other Americans, Europeans, uh, uh, other people, just like us, the normal people, okay? What would you recommend to, like, let's say, Americans, you know, what can they do if they're already seeing this being uh, promoted, uh, what can they do? They, they don't have the luxury like you to, you know, or the land right. to move to, let's say, Russia. What would you recommend? Just like a normal American. Very, very simple. Very simple. Stop playing the game. Stop playing this game. Everything that's being done is to divide. And at this point, people are taking sides like it's a sports team, right? When, when you follow sports, you're a diehard fan of a sports team. They win, they lose, you stick with them. So what I mean by that, people take sides, and when the facts are presented on both sides, uh, whether it's politically, whether it's religiously, people don't look at facts anymore. they just like, I'm going to die on this side of the hill. But people don't realize every single thing out there is to divide us. We need to unite. We need to unite. Racism, all that shit is fabricated. Uh, I, I forgot who said it. I think, I think Denzel Washington actually had this quote, or was it Morgan Freeman or somebody? He basically said, do you, want, do you want racism to go away? Stop talking about it. Exactly. Now it's being taught everywhere. It's constantly being reminded. I'm just, you, And that's just one end of the spectrum. So what I'm trying to say is that it seems like the governments around the world don't really care about their people. Everything that's being done is in the name of some kind of a, a higher you know, good. But people are, being, uh, people are suffering and then other people taking sides and we all fighting each other. That's what we need to do. Stop. Everyone should love each other. Everyone should um, be compassionate to each other and stop eating. Um, I guess stop consuming and reading the propaganda. Stop watching the propaganda. Because if you're watching the news, that's what I was doing before. You know, I was out there screaming, I'm right, you're wrong. Because, oh, I, I if I'm conservative, then you're that. No, we should all, you know, and we should all love each other. And I, you know, not to go away from the subject, but going back to spirituality, you know, I would really help me. I truly believe we come here and our souls stay here for a purpose. We all walk our own path, right? We all walk our own path. My path and, you, and your path is very different. And we're here to learn certain things. So when I meet someone that does not resonate with me, I don't like him or we just completely different. All I'm telling myself is that person is the way he is because of his path. He chose this path. He needs to go through that path, right? Does not mean I need to hate him because we've been programmed to hate. If some, if we don't like something, then it's we against it. If we don't understand something, then we fear it. If we, you know what I mean? But instead, yeah, doesn't that make our world a beautiful that we are no. all so different that our right. differences the make it a resilient uh, ecosystem? It's, I told my wife, I'm Russian. She's my, uh, she's she's Guatemalan, Colombian, right? She's Latin. America has so many different nationalities. So our cultures is what makes us unique. If we if we just mix into one, 
there's absolutely no uniqueness. There's no interest in the world anymore. So we should stay. Everyone should stay unique to each other. I'm not saying everybody should uh, become a certain person or a mold, but we should accept each other um, for, for our, our differences. Exactly. For our uniqueness. Our just the problem is it takes a collective effort, but somebody has to start doing it. And Meaning we can that answer for ourselves. So yes, I can I can it, do that today. Exactly, and I. You know, I used to be very um, my my um, personality was I was very short tempered. I would scream. I would sometimes fight. You know, growing up, and I finally reached the stage in life where I see what's going on, and I understand that in order for me to make a difference, if I meet someone I disagree with, somebody does does something wrong to me, I need to be like, okay, I still love you. And show compassion and move on. Not start arguing with him. Start fighting with him. Uh, say bad things back. You know what I mean? That's where you start. So, And the way you start is you just understand that everything around us is here to divide us. That's it. They, you know, it seems like the governments don't care about you at the end of the day. You know, everybody takes sides because they think they have a vote, uh, a vote or what they say counts. You don't count. You're not going to make a difference. But the only difference you can make is how you treat another human being. And if enough people do that, it will show other human beings. And if if everyone if, if you have one bad person and everyone around them is trying in the good, that person is going to change as well eventually. So I'm saying I don't know how to change the world. But my, my, my advice is, and again, not to beat around the bush and go around, is to stop playing this game, man. Stop playing this game. Next time you see uh, two people fighting over politics or something else – don't take sides. Kind of look, look, look at it from above. And, and like now, what I do is when I see what's going on in America with the politics and all that, I used to be like, oh, I vote for him or for him, or they're wrong, or look, these people are crazy. Now I'm just like, okay, I see it, I process, I let it go. It doesn't bother me anymore because I truly believe at this point in my life, nothing can, nothing can touch me. I create my own reality in that sense, right? So when I, what everything else is going on in the world, I'm looking through a glass window. And that gives me inner peace, but that also gives me enough strength and understanding to continue to be compassionate to everyone I meet now. Now I make sure I hold the door. I make sure somebody looks at me, I smile at them. I may, uh, you know, back in New York, I'd be like, you know, what are you looking at? What's up? You know, and the programming is there for you to be that way, but you got to. You got to show compassion, basically. And I truly believe that whatever you put out, like you said, you know, karma or cause and effect, whatever you put out, you will get back. Mm -hmm. So if anything that if you need a reason to, to be kind to other people, just remember whatever you do, maybe it's not going to be right away. You will get it back. Yeah. So yeah. On that note, I think that's been such a lovely uh, conversation. I really likewise, man. Chatting with you, and I'm sure there's going to be more in the future as you experience. I'd love to. Yeah. And, uh, also, when we when we finally move back, man, we have gotta hang out. I'm gonna come and visit you. You gotta show me. Yeah, uh, what you built. So I, I'm I'm I've got this property development concept coming. You know, working in my head that, and I'm really looking for a team to do it together to collaborate because it's so difficult to do it alone. That's why when you said project management, I was like, yes, you know. Uh -huh, yeah, but basically, yeah, yeah. for Americans and Europeans who want to move away from S and the L agenda and all of that that's just not good just against humanity when people start running away from not literally literally running because uh, stop playing the game yes but if you know things are collapsing uh, around you step yeah you have out. to do something step about out. it right yeah step out like mm -hmm. you're saying you don't want to play the game but at the same time you don't want to stay within the country so when some other people who decide that and understand that Russia is one of those freedom pockets, true sovereign country that's not under anybody else, that you have the freedom, no building codes, uh, fresh organic milk and all those good things, humane things. We still have our problems here, obviously. It's not all, uh, you know, it's not a haven on it's Earth. It's not. Uh, it's exactly. not, it's but really people... cold and... and so people, people would ask me about it, yeah. right? Uh, just to, and I apologize for interrupting you, but that's another big thing. People would ask me all the time, "What are you doing here?" When I would come from Russia, oh, America is so much better because 
Russian people also, a lot of them don't know. They they hear about America, and I always tell them, go and uh, figure it, go and see for yourself what what you know. My decision is based on my experience there, but I always say, listen, these are the problems in America. These are the problems in Russia, right that I see or read about. What is more important for you? I take this side because that's what resonates with me more. I'll take the problems in Russia right now. Yeah, yeah. If you in think fact, the problem problems in America are, are you know way less than it is in Russia, more power to you. You should move to America or any other country. Well, you know, just, we all make just, our own decisions. J just to cap up on that, within twenty five years of in living in South Africa, having a successful business, where in two thousand and seven I turned over a million dollars in one year, not profit turnover. I no, worked that's... out was nothing <laughs> after 25 years. Four suitcases. There's a few more suitcases in my mom's garage. Uh, and within a couple of years of being back in Russia, uh, I have, I'm sitting in a home on my own land, debt free. So, <laughs> you know, uh, I might not be swimming in chocolate, but I have a home and I'm debt free and uh, prices are cheap. Electricity is cheap. Uh, and I've got a beautiful city, like an hour and a half drive away on a, on a train. And the public what else do you is need? Phenomenal. Yeah, it's like what it's else awesome. do you need? I just went snowboarding to Murmansk. Uh, it was beautiful mountain, like Switzerland region. Uh, took a mm -hmm. snow, uh, snowboarding. Maybe when you come over, we can go do that. I'm coming snowboard. over. They snowboard until April. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> People go in their bikinis, and in April, because it's already warm. Uh, May, that's warm. The uh, girls in their bikinis and they're snowboarding. It's because snow is still lying. That's but the funny. Sun, sun is baking. So, yeah, on that good note, uh, I forgot what we we're talking about. But on that good note, I think we should definitely connect again. And thank you for your time. For I sure. Really, really, really appreciate it. I just want to say thank you for having me, man. Uh, we could probably talk till morning. So we do have to wrap it up at some point. But it was just a real pleasure to meet you it was a real pleasure to meet you and to talk to you and zoe as well for our communication so i, I definitely would like to meet up with you guys and it's been a pleasure thank you for having me thanks brother alex uh, i'm looking forward to strengthening our friendship